Hi, my name is Mark Kolbeck, and I'm going to be demonstrating how to do the initial patient approach as a paramedic using the safety first get ABCD mnemonic. So the first thing I'm going to do is S, or safety, stands for body substance isolation, and my partner and I are wearing our gloves and our goggles. F stands for fire or scene safety, and I'm taking a look at the scene. The dispatch information is for a 40-year-old female with abdominal pain in bed, and that's how I see it, so I can determine that the scene is safe. I is for incident. I've already been notified of what the call is. Again, the information that I see corresponds to that. So I'll say that my incident is a medical call, not a trauma, not a trauma call, and that is for abdominal pain. R is for number of patients, and I see that there's only the one patient. S is send for help, and at this point, it seems to be a call that my partner and I can handle without assistance, so I won't be sending for help. And the T in safety first is, uh, first of all, triage, if there's more than one patient, but there's only one, so I don't need to do triage. Or if there is only one patient, in this case, I do uh, trauma to the C-spine. Because of the call information and seeing as I see it, I'm gonna rule out trauma to the C-spine, so I don't do, need to do any cervical spine immobilization. That's my safety first. GET, G-E-T, stands G for general impression. And my general impression is that I'm in a private residence with an approximately 40-year-old woman in mild distress lying supine in bed. E is to estimate levels of awareness. And at this point, I actually begin to approach my patient. I say, hello, ma'am. My name's Mark, and I'm a paramedic. How are you today? Patient responds to me that she's feeling well, but she has a bit of abdominal pain. Uh, and from that, I know that she is alert using my AVPU or AVPU scale, where A stands for alert, uh, V stands for verbal, P stands for pain, and U stands for unresponsive. So I have an alert patient. That's the E in GET, and the T in GET stands for threats, so I take a quick heads up and I make sure there are still no threats to myself, my team, or my patient, and there aren't, so I can continue on. Um, I've done my safety first and my get. Now I'm going to do my primary ABCDs. Primary A stands for airway, so I'm ensuring that the patient has an airway. She's already spoken to me, so I know she must have an airway and she must be breathing, otherwise she wouldn't be able to speak. So airway is fine. B stands for breathing, and I need to determine whether or not my patient is breathing. And as we've already seen, she's talking to me, so I know that she's breathing. And a quick assessment seems that she's breathing fairly well, so I don't need to take any interventions. As with all patients, when we're doing the scenarios, I'm going to have my partner uh, set up an oxygen mask, 15 liters, non-rebreather, instruct the patient what they're setting up and how, and have the patient breathing into the mask. Later on, I can titrate that down to nasal cannulas or off, as long as their SATs are good. But for now, in my initial ABCDs, I'm going to give them a big rush of oxygen. C, primary C, stands for circulation, and there's three parts to the circulation check. The first is I'm going to check to make sure they have a pulse. I can tell because they're talking to me that they already do, but I want a quick idea of the quality of the pulse, so I'm going to do a carotid and radial quick pulse check, see if it's present, and to see if it's of reasonable quality, and it seems to be. So that's the first part of circulation, is pulse check. Second part of circulation is a skin check, so I'll pull back my glove and use the back of my hand, and put that on the patient's forehead, and I'll note that the patient's skin is pink, warm, and dry, obviously a good sign, uh, and my skin check is done. Third thing I'm gonna do is a gross bleed check. In this situation, there probably is not a gross bleed, so I could simply ask my patient, are you bleeding or injured anywhere? Uh, I can also do a quick anterior bleed check because I can see the anterior portion of the body. If I was concerned about an occult posterior bleed, I could use my hands, and by going underneath the small of the back, underneath the scapula and an X from the hips up, taking a quick look at my gloves to see if there's any blood. There isn't, so I can rule out a gross bleed. So my primary circulation check of pulse, skin, and gross bleed is complete. And now I move to my primary D, which is decision. And I need to make two decisions, a treatment decision and a transport decision. In terms of treatment, since this is medical, my question is the D of defibrillation. Do they need to be defibrillated? 
since they're alert and talking to me, they obviously do not need to be defibrillated, so I can rule out any urgent primary treatment at this point. If they were a trauma patient, my um, treatment decision would be, do they have any gross disabilities? That's the D I'd be looking for. And obviously, in this case, it's not trauma, so I don't need to worry about that. Those are my treatment decisions. The transport decision is the next decision that I need to make. And the question at this point, is this a uh, patient that I can remain to investigate further, or do I have to urgently load and go? The question is load and go or stay and play. In this case, because of the presentation, I can say I can probably have time to stay and play, and I can take a little bit more time to properly assess my patient before I initiate transport. So I've done safety first, uh, I've done get, I've done primary ABCDs. Now, if I was an ALS provider doing a scenario like this, I would move into the secondary ABCDs. If you're not an ALS provider, you don't need to demonstrate this. Uh, if you're BLS, you're done at the primary ABCDs. But for the sake of uh, demonstration, we'll move on to secondary ABCDs and explain what we do at that point. So for secondary ABCDs, I go back to airway and I need to make sure that my airway is open, patent, and secure. So if it was not open, patent, and secure, I would consider doing an advanced airway technique like laryngeal mask or endotracheal intubation. In this case, I can rule that out. That's not necessary. If there was any evidence of a foreign body airway obstruction, I could use my laryngoscope and McNeil forceps to try and take out the foreign body airway obstruction if necessary. Uh, in this case, it's not necessary. I can rule it out. The third thing I would do with airway is if I'm in a can't intubate, can't ventilate, CICV patient, can't intubate, can't ventilate, then I would start to consider the possibility of doing a surgical airway technique at some point. Again here, fortunately, I don't need to. The patient has a patent secure airway. So that's my primary, or rather my secondary airway considerations. My secondary breathing considerations are two part. I want to know about the gases going in and out, and I want to have a quick listen to uh, the patient's chest to make sure they're breathing okay. It's actually three part. The third thing I want to do is make sure there's no problems with uh, tension pneumothorax. So in terms of gas in and gas out, the first thing I'm going to do is put a SpO2 monitor onto the patient's finger and see what their oxygen saturation is. If it was clinically indicated and if I had the uh, technical equipment for it, I could put on um, end tidal CO2 for a spontaneously non-intubated patient which would be like nasal cannulas that hook up to your monitor and hopefully give you a nice waveform of end tidal CO2. In this case, for a simple abdo pain, I probably would not use the end tidal CO2, but I would ask my partner to put on the uh, SpO2 finger probe at this point so I can get an idea of their oxygen saturation. I'll take my stethoscope and at this point do a very cursory quick listen to the patient's breathing. I do a four-point auscultation. Uh, just ask the patient breathe in, breathe out, Breathe in, breathe out, listen to the apices and the bases of the lungs. Breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out. And I note that the patient has good air entry bilaterally. That helps me uh, get an idea of their baseline of breathing. It also helps me to rule out the possibility of a tension pneumothorax. And there are other things I could look at. If there was a tension pneumothorax suspected and I had decided to treat for it, I could do a chest needle decompression. In this case, again, clearly not indicated. So my secondary breathing is the SpO2 and then tidal CO2, the gas in and out. Uh, have a listen to the gas going in and out of the chest and rule out the need for tension pneumothorax. Now I can move on to secondary circulation. So there's a few things I would consider. Uh, I would probably put uh, ECG onto this patient and do simple rhythm interpretation. If the abdo pain sounded a bit suspicious and it was leading over into ischemic chest pain territory, or if they have a lot of cardiac risk factors, or if there's any red flags that come up that make me think cardiac, I might elect to do a 12 lead ECG on scene. So ECG is the first part of my circulation. Second part of my circulation is to consider an IV line. If, uh, if I thought it was indicated for a possible fluid replacement or medication administration, I would set up a peripheral IV line uh, and have that established probably at this point PKO. And the third thing I would do is if there's any evidence of altered mental status, I'd use the flashback on the IV to do random blood glucose, get an idea of my patient's blood glucose level and determine whether or not I think I'm going to be having to intervene in terms of administering IV dextrose or oral dextrose in this case, if they're alert and oriented enough. 
So that's my secondary uh, circulation, and my secondary D is for decision. So my first decision in my secondary D is how acute do I think this patient is? And I use the rough idea of not sick, sick, very sick, or dead. They're obviously not dead. Uh, they don't seem to be very sick at this point. They're not complaining of any of the critical signs. And the three critical signs that we look for are altered mental status, ischemic chest pain, or respiratory distress, roughly correlating to brains, heart, and lungs. Do they have any problems with those organs? If they don't, that's great. I'm going to determine that this patient at this point is sick because they do have a complaint of abdominal pain, but it's not one of the critical complaints of altered mental status, ischemic chest pain, or shortness of breath, so I'm going to classify them as sick. Uh, the next decision I need to make in terms of secondary decision is roughly what medical guideline or protocol do I think I'm going to be falling into. And at this point, I haven't heard anything to make me think that I'm going to be moving away from abdominal pain. I haven't done a proper investigation yet. But at this preliminary point, moving through my secondary ABCDs, I'm thinking I'm still generally on the page of uh, abdominal pain not yet diagnosed. The third D that I need to make a decision about is my transport decision. Has anything happened in the past few minutes that makes me think that I need to change my uh, transport decision from stay and play to a load and go? And is there anything that would indicate a specific hospital that I would probably have to transport to? At this point, I'm still going to say that I, I'm staying with the decision to stay and play and do a further assessment on my patient. And I haven't heard anything yet that would indicate to me that I need to make a specific transport decision to a specialized hospital. So at this point, I've done safety first, get, I've done my primary ABCDs and my secondary ABCDs, and I've completed the uh, patient approach part of my scenario. I've done this initial check sheet. The second part that I'm going to do is move into doing the call completion, which is the ICI had vital signs uh, assessed and treated.